The next daytime activity that can greatly affect sleep is napping. I get asked about napping all the time. Is it good for sleep or is it bad? Is it the, when's the best time to nap, when's not a good time to nap? Should I be worried or feel guilty if I'm tempted to take a nap? Let me be clear, I love napping. I see almost nothing wrong with it, especially if you do not get great sleep the night before. However, there is one group of people who should never nap, people with insomnia. Why? Because napping during the day can actually reduce your sleep drive, and that's one of the things that people with insomnia really need. Remember, the buildup of adenosine is what makes us feel sleepy at the end of the day. Napping causes your brain to eat up some of that adenosine so that once night comes, there isn't much adenosine hanging around as if there would be if you hadn't napped. But does this mean that napping is bad? Absolutely not. Ideally, you're getting the right amount of sleep for your body and you don't need a nap, which is the goal of the course. But the idea of napping being associated with being lazy or being unproductive is complete nonsense. How often do you feel your energy sag in the early to mid afternoon? While some doctors may tell you that that's an issue with cortisol or maybe thyroid hormone, I'm gonna tell you something different. There's actually a biological reason behind that energy slump, and it has to do with our friend melatonin. We are actually biologically designed to sleep in a very long stretch throughout the night and to take a brief rest in the middle of the day. Have any of you ever traveled to Latin America? What happens between one and three in the afternoon? Siesta, that's right. It turns out that this is a biologically driven event. Between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m., our body temperature actually drops, which causes our melatonin levels to rise. Both are cues for sleep. Even though our modern culture doesn't support daytime naps as our bodies remain kind of hardwired for a midday recharge, I call this the biological siesta. Napping has a lot of benefits on our health, and it can increase our alertness, improve our concentration and accuracy, help you make better decisions, even enhance your memory and learning, improve your mood, and so much more. A 2009 study found that among nappers, brain activity associated with concentration was as strong in the afternoon as in the morning, while with non-nappers, they saw a decline. Bottom line, a short afternoon nap can improve accuracy as well as provide a boost to short-term memory. Naps can help make newly learned information stick in your brain and can improve memory recall. One study found that a 60 to 90 minute nap can aid learning as well as a full night of sleep. Another reason to consider napping is if you're someone who makes impulsive decisions. Research suggests naps can improve emotional regulation, including increasing your ability to tolerate frustration and reducing your tendency to be impulsive. Just think about it like this. When your toddler needs a nap, you know it. And when they've gotten one, you also know it. The two big factors to consider when planning naps are duration and timing. Let's tackle the question of when to nap first. As a general rule, according to Dr. Sarah Mednick's research at the University of California, the best time to nap is approximately seven hours after you wake for the day. But why? That's the time when you're going to strike the ideal balance of REM sleep and slow wave sleep in a nap, giving you both the mental and the physical restoration, as well as minimizing your post-nap grogginess. Okay, so now we know when, but how long should our naps be? We have a couple of options for this one. The goal of both types of naps is to wake from a lighter phase of sleep so that we aren't groggy for the rest of the day. I mean, let's be honest, how many of you out there have had a nap and felt worse, not better, after the nap? A nap of less than 25 minutes will make sure that you wake up before you enter deep, slow wave sleep. You'll wake up feeling energized and alert because you never entered a deep sleep cycle. A 90 minute nap takes you through an incomplete sleep cycle from light sleep to deep sleep and on into REM sleep, and then back to light sleep again. This will leave you feeling refreshed and energized and focused for the rest of your day. Remember, as I said before, there are some people that should not nap. People with insomnia or depression already have disrupted sleep-wake cycles, so napping can further interfere with their circadian rhythm. And what if your energy is perfect throughout the day? Should you still nap? Probably not. But if there are occasions when you need to get an extra few minutes of Zs, now you have the tools to make it effective. Up next is one of the master regulators of our circadian rhythm, sunlight. Let's talk about getting sunlight and how it can help you with your daytime energy. Yes, this is a sleep class, but sunlight is one of the best natural resources that you can have, not only to help you feel energy during the day, but to sleep well at night as well. My recommendations are simple. First, see if you can get 15 minutes of sunlight within 30 minutes of waking up. This helps clear the cobwebs of your morning foggy brain by turning off the melatonin faucet in your head. I usually recommend you do this while drinking 20 ounces of water. 
Remember, you wake up dehydrated, so getting water before coffee is critical for your daytime performance. Next, make sure you go outside during lunch if possible. This allows for a quick shot of sunshine which will help wake you up. Remember when we were talking about the perfect timing for a nap? It's between 1 and 3 in the afternoon. But what if you can't nap? Well, your boss might not like it, so what, what else can you possibly do? Then go outside and get some sunshine. This will actually also stop that melatonin surge and eliminate your need for a cup of coffee. If lunch is indoors, then at around 2 p.m., instead of your final cup of coffee, go outside and take a sunshine break, not a coffee break. Once again, this will help you with your energy levels. Also, here's a little known fact. Vitamin D, which your body produces when you're in the sun, also helps regulate your sleep cycles. So you can get two benefits for just one action. When you are out in the sunshine, hopefully you'll also be harnessing the powers of exercise and its potent benefits for your sleep patterns. Exercise during the day is one of the best things that you can do to improve your overall sleep quality. Physical activity increases time spent in deep sleep, the most physically restorative sleep phase. Deep sleep helps boost immune function, support cardiac health, and control both stress and anxiety. In addition to improving the quality of sleep, exercise can also help you increase the duration of your nightly rest. Being physically active requires you to expend energy and helps you feel more tired and ready to rest at the end of the day. Studies indicate that sleep may receive some of its most significant benefits from exercise that is both consistent and routine over time. This is especially true for people who experience difficulty sleeping. To answer the question of when is the best time to exercise, you need to understand your chronotype. So if you haven't already done so, please go take the chronotype quiz today and dial it into your exercise routine. We're going to dive into the science behind how exercise improves sleep in depth in episodes to come, so be sure to complete the entire course. I know we covered a lot today, including some of the big daily activities that can dramatically impact how restful our sleep is. If we can harness the positive effects of exercise and napping and limit the negative effects of caffeine and alcohol, we can then create huge shifts in our sleep patterns only for the better. A healthy sleep-wake cycle begins with our choices throughout the day, so choose wisely and sleep well. One of the most popular questions I get asked regularly is, can I catch up on sleep on the weekends? Just to give a little background, in the sleep medicine literature, there's an established relationship between sleep duration and mortality, or death. Too little sleep, less than five hours, or too much sleep, more than 10 hours, leads to an increased risk of mortality. A new study looking at almost 44,000 people over 13 years found some really interesting results. For people who were less than 65 years old, who slept less than five hours during the week, they had a 52% higher mortality rate than the comparison group at the same age and sleeping seven hours during the week. No association was found for long weekend sleep greater than nine hours when compared to the comparison group of seven hour sleeper for this particular age group. So here's what I learned. The comparison group who only slept seven hours is the way to go. If you can keep your total sleep time to seven hours, seven days a week, you're not gonna have a whole lot of problems. I have a little bit more proof. In a recent poll by the National Sleep Foundation, they learned that when people had a consistent sleep schedule, six and a half hours a night or more, it had a protective effect when schedules get crazy. This means that those who got consistent total sleep and sleep at the right time for them were protected from many of the harmful effects of sleep deprivation. The results are clear. If you stay in bed on the weekends for two hours longer than usual, you are far more likely to be grouchy, fat, and sick. If you sleep in for less than an hour on the weekends, you are statistically safe from suffering all of those ill effects. Thanks for hanging out with me and learning more about your sleep. A quick homework assignment for you is to make a list of all of the daytime activities that you participate and how you're going to change them for better sleep. For example, when do you drink caffeine, nap, get sunshine, drink alcohol, or exercise? All of those are gonna be important and I'm gonna encourage you to share them with the community. And that's a wrap for day two. I hope you're leaving with a better understanding of how your common daytime activities affect your nighttime sleep. Make sure to get plenty of rest tonight because tomorrow we are diving into tools to improve your nighttime routine and I have a lot of great tricks to share with you. This is Dr. Michael Bruce wishing you sweet dreams.